has to be a very tense moment for this young player. A challenging 403 yard par four. He's stepping up to the tee. Yeah! Bring the game of golf right into your own living room. Hole in one golf. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate Super Nintendo Review here on Player One Start. Previously in this series, we took a look at the history and development of the Super Nintendo, as well as some of the tech specs, and we started looking at the launch lineup in the previous video. And in this video, we're going to continue taking a look at the games that were released before the end of 1991. Nintendo hit the ground running in 1991. They kind of had to because they had to make up for almost two years of console sales from both the TurboGrafx and mainly Sega. The TurboGrafx was already kind of on its way out as the Super Nintendo launched, kind of putting its final nail in the coffin was the launch of the Super Nintendo. But they had a lot of good titles to choose from at the very beginning. The problem is Sega had a lot more titles, but were they as good? Well, that's the topic for the 16-bit war, so we're not going to cover it here in this video. But let's go ahead and take a look at other titles that released in 1991. Although the Super Nintendo had a limited launch lineup, I think most people were probably satisfied with just getting Super Mario World. F-Zero was also a fun distraction, and there were some other ones there just to get you started. But there were still some popular game genres missing from the lineup, and by September of 1991 they would be expanding into other territories, such as sports, role-playing games, and even a fighter. So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, we're starting out with these early. Draken, yeah, we'll go with that, is an early 3D role-playing video game that was initially developed for the Amiga and Atari ST computer systems. However, it eventually made its way over to other platforms, including the Super Nintendo. This game is notable for being one of the first role-playing games to feature a three-dimensional playing field, as well as being an early example of a real-time tactics game. Something I found unique about this game is that you're given almost free reign over the world map very quickly after starting the game. When comparing it to its computer counterparts though, this game is a bit different. The biggest notable difference would be in its visual layout and color scheme. Diving into the core of the gameplay though, as you explore the landscape, 
you can battle against other enemies at random chance encounters. Once you've defeated your enemy, of course you gain experience and items you would expect to get in an RPG, but I found out that you can flee any battle by pressing the left and right shoulder buttons, which makes all battles on this overworld map completely optional. However, when you enter the dungeons or castles, not so much. Where some of the real-time strategy comes in is that you actually are able to kind of micromanage your four players as they attack each enemy. This allows you to strategize how you use your magic, items, and special abilities all throughout each battle. And again, defeating enemies give you experience while fleeing from battles does not. Each of your party members fills one role, either scout, wizard, fighter, or priest. Each of them have different strengths and abilities. The player can obtain items that can be purchased from traveling merchants who ambush the party or at the tavern. Again, the armor, weapons, healing items, rings, and accessories are all items that are categorized in the shop. As previously mentioned, one of the goals in the game is to attack each castle, which kind of act like temples that will be found in like the Legend of Zelda games. These are little self-contained levels with obstacles, loot, enemies, and maze-like architecture, and they must be visited at least once, and the order in which you tackle them is decided by you. Something I found a bit strange in this game is I didn't really get what the story was supposed to be, as I found there was a lack of direction on how to approach this game. A strategy guide would be recommended for new players, especially just to get you going. And make sure you find something specific to the Super Nintendo version, because even the story in this game is different from its PC counterparts. Reading one description of how this game was ported to the Super Nintendo is that the storyline is a result of a broken translation and rewrite of the original, as well as lack of supplemental stories that would be found in the computer versions. Overall, the game has four areas of the continent that you're on that you will have to visit before you end the game. My first time playing through this game was as an adult and for this review, and I was actually kind of impressed at what they were able to pull off so early on the Super Nintendo. This definitely shows something that wouldn't have been able to be done, at least at this smooth frame rate, on a previous system. And for fans of role-playing games that were probably getting tired of the 2D layout of games, may have found this a refreshing break. But when looking at reviews of this game, Nintendo Power gave this version a mixed score of around 3.1 out of 5 stars. And as those reviews have gotten more closer to modern day, a lot of people have been calling it confusing and unplayable. And I do agree with it being confusing, but it is something you can figure out with time, the only problem is how motivated you are to do so. Overall, I'd give this about a 6 out of 10, nothing that's essential for your collection, but a hardcore fan of RPGs that want to see kind of what the first experimental 3D RPG was, yeah, this would be something to look at. <laughs> Super R-Type is a game that I have played several times over, as this is one of the first games that we got after we got the Super Nintendo. But I will point out that wasn't by my choice. Most of our game purchasing decisions at that time would have been decided by one of my three older brothers. So while I probably would have chose something different than they did, it didn't stop me from enjoying this game a lot as a kid. If you've never played an R-Type game, I'll just briefly go over the details, as it's been covered before in one of these reviews. But this is almost as basic as a side-scrolling shooter can get, where you fly through areas destroying enemies, avoiding projectiles, and getting power-ups to increase your weapon's power, as well as what type of weapon you have. Make it to the end of each stage and you face off against a boss, and then the process starts all over until you beat the game. In terms of this game specifically, Super R-Type borrows some stages from R-Type 2 and adds some new ones. But again, if you are new to this series, be prepared because this game is very, very difficult. After years of not playing this game, I myself am even out of practice with it, as I used to be able to beat this game on hard difficulty, but now I have to play it on novice just to be able to get through the first few levels. And as with a lot of early side-scrolling shooters, this game does suffer from a lot of slowdown. Which, after years of playing it, I have completely gotten used to and doesn't even affect my gameplay anymore. In fact, if this slowdown wasn't in the areas that it is in, because I anticipate that coming up, I would be thrown completely off. In my opinion, it does make a few of those sections where there's a lot of projectiles and enemies on screen a bit easier, because it gives you a little bit more time to plan and adjust your ship's course. 
The soundtrack, while nothing exceptional, is really not bad, and I have definitely gotten used to it and even anticipate some of the themes that go through this game. Of course, the visuals are a welcome upgrade from the Super Nintendo, with one of the first things I noticed being just how large some of these enemies are, not just the bosses. When this game came out, Entertainment Weekly selected this game as the number two greatest game available in 1991. Other review scores were around a 7 to 8 out of 10, with a lot of reviewers pointing out how some of the difficulty is exacerbated by the fact that there are no checkpoints during the levels. That's right, you die in a certain spot in the level, and it's back to the very beginning of the level for you. But back during a time when Super Mario World and this game were my only two games available for this system, I had no problem getting through part of this game, and when I got frustrated with it, I switched to Super Mario World, and then switched back to this one, and then I could beat through the area I was previously stuck on. Overall, while I don't consider this an essential for everybody's collection, I definitely have a lot of nostalgia for this title, and really like coming back to it on my Super Nintendo. UN Squadron is another capable side-scrolling shooter, this one released by Capcom for the Super Nintendo, and I would say this one is pretty good as well. Again, this is not one I played as a kid, nor even rented. My first time playing it was for this review, and I didn't find it too bad, but I didn't really find anything that stuck out about it. Basically, instead of having the sci-fi theme, it's a bit more realistically based in the fact that you are flying an actual fighter craft that could have existed on Earth. So if the sci-fi theme isn't for you, and you'd like a very capable shooter, this one could be for you as well. In terms of modern versus classic reviews, they haven't really softened as much as I've seen for other games, so it still holds up well today. I even saw that IGN ranked it as number 37 on its top 100 Super NES games list, which made it the highest ranking side-scrolling shooter on that list. Other game publications of fans have also called this game out for this as well, so it's definitely worth a look if you have a Super Nintendo. Hyperzone is another shooter, but this time it's more of an on-rail shooter game where you have a third-person perspective behind your ship and the level scrolls in front of you. The point of this game is to navigate each level while shooting enemies and earning points until you finally encounter an enemy boss at the end of each level. After you earn enough points, your ship can be upgraded at the beginning of the next stage. The player's ship can receive up to six upgrades. This game is kind of a cross between F-Zero with its Mode 7 use, and kind of the Star Fox in its 3D perspective. The game contains a total of 8 levels, and after the initial game is finished, it restarts with the player continuing in their final ship and keeping score. The game eventually just loops infinitely. For me personally though, this game is mainly all visuals and not enough gameplay to keep me interested. Review scores of this game are all over the place. I've seen 3 out of 10, to 9 out of 10, which really just shows how subjective your playthrough is going to be. I personally would give this either a 5 or 6 out of 10, as I didn't really see anything game-breaking in it, but there wasn't really anything to make me want to come back to this game other than its impressive use of early 3D visuals.
Chess Master was also an early title for the Super Nintendo, and the only thing I can say about it is, it is Chess Master and it is on the Super Nintendo. Moving on, longtime fans of the channel will know that I definitely enjoy a good golf video game, and this one, Howl's Hole in One Golf, would have been good for the time, but not really something I like to come back to. This game is published by Howl Laboratory. That's right, the same company responsible for Kirby and Super Smash Bros. decided golf it is. I really do like the Mode 7 view of each course you get. Unfortunately, that's not the same perspective you get when you're actually playing the course, as this does to me, kind of remind me of NES Golf, just with updated visuals. And wouldn't you know it, they also designed Golf for the NES as well. The control system reminds me of early Microsoft Golf for the PC, so after choosing your club and direction you want the ball to go, the system where you choose your power is you click once at the top, and click once again at the bottom as close as you can to center, and your shot would be accurate. Overall a neat golf game, but not the quintessential golf game for the Super Nintendo. Still it's cheap enough, so golf fans go crazy with this one. Populous is a strategy, or otherwise known as a god game, that was originally developed by Bullfrog Productions and published by Electronic Arts. The first system it came out for was the Amiga, and yes, you'll notice that trend going forward with the Super Nintendo, with games first being on the Amiga and then being ported to the Super Nintendo. That also goes for the Genesis as well. But the Amiga would set the standard for what 16-bit gaming should be, and if a game was successful on the Amiga, it wouldn't be too much of a risk to port it to the Super Nintendo. But anyway, in this game, you assume the role of a deity who must lead followers through direction, manipulation, and divine intervention with the goal of eliminating the followers led by the opposite deity. Kind of like that one episode of Futurama where Bender becomes a god, but anyway. The game is played from an isometric perspective to give you more of a 3D look, and in terms of my gameplay experience, this is populous and it plays very well on the Super Nintendo. I'm actually kind of impressed that my lack of a mouse didn't really come into play with this game as it did with SimCity. Maybe it's because I played SimCity more on the PC back in the day, and Populous I've played on multiple platforms. Still, this is a very competent port, which I've also seen make it on the very bottom of a couple top 100 games lists for the Super Nintendo. But again, I'm not going to recommend this game as essential for everyone, just for those that like these type of strategy games. Super Bass is Loaded got its start on the Nintendo Entertainment System and was produced by... I've been criticized for saying this wrong before. Is it Jalico? 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 I don't know. But anyway, this is the fifth overall installment in the series and the first on the Super Nintendo. And aside from some visual and sound upgrades, there really isn't much to say about this game except for it is Bass is Loaded on the Super Nintendo. It's a decently playable baseball game that definitely takes advantage of the Super Nintendo in a couple of areas, like making the diamond spin around in Mode 7. And you can tell there's some more color and detail on the field and on the players as well. Which makes it interesting to me why some reviews of this game were very critical of the fact that the gameplay and sound effects weren't that good and they were let down by poor graphics and an unfinished look. To be honest, this would have been perfectly acceptable to me in 1991, although nowadays I probably wouldn't go back to it and play it that much, unless I had a particular nostalgia for this title. But I'd say this game deserves about an 8 out of 10.
Ultraman Towards the Future is a fighting video game that was developed by BEC and published by Bandai for the Super Nintendo. And if you're like me and had never heard of this game before this review, it is based on the TV series Ultraman Towards the Future, which was a big hit in Japan in the 60s, and it was being rebooted in North America at around the time of this game's release. Sadly, this is one of the first games where I'm gonna say, nope, this is definitely skippable. It is a subpar fighting experience with lackluster graphics and gameplay that just leaves me wanting more out of a fighter. This definitely feels like one of those licensed titles that just didn't live up to what you were hoping for with the experience. Those are all of the games that released in the first month after the Super Nintendo launched. Out of those games, the one I played the most was Super R-Type. But again, that's because out of all these games, that was the only other one we owned when I was younger. Going back to these games today, I think Super R-Type is probably still my favorite. Hyperzone is interesting, which keeps me coming back to it. UN Squadron is fun for a good shoot-em-up. But the rest of these games are kind of lackluster and unimpressive, at least to me. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below which ones of these are childhood favorites of yours, or ones you discovered years later. And stay tuned for the next video where I take a look at games released by the end of the year in 1991. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A special thanks to those Patreons you see on screen. Also, if you like what you see, please remember to leave a like and click that subscribe button on your way out. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.